today I will be talking about the relation between radiative recombination and absorption. As you know from uh, Kirchhoff's principles, a uh, good emitter is a good absorber. Similarly, in the case of uh, semiconductors, one can show that a material uh, like gallium arsenide, which is a direct cap material, uh, is a good emitter. It has high probability of radiative recombination. Since it is a good absorber, it has a very low absorption depth. This relation between radiative recombination and uh, absorption was first obtained by Shockley and Van Roosbreck. And hence, it is called the Shockley Van Roosbreck relation. And it was derived for uh, radiative recombination between conduction band and valence band. Uh, however, it is valid for uh, all types of radiative recombination. And as I will show, the principle enables you to calculate if you know what the optical absorption spectrum is, it will enable you to calculate what the radiative recombination spectra is. And as you know, optical absorption is fairly simple to uh, measure uh, using a spe spectrophotometer. So if you know alpha E over a range of energy, you should be able to calculate what is the spontaneous radiative recombination spectra over the same energy. Now, in order to do that, uh, one has to consider that in thermal equilibrium, the rate of uh, absorption and the rate of recombination are equal. Okay, so what is the rate of generation of electron hole pairs in a semiconductor in thermal equilibrium? The rate of generation of electron hole pairs uh, is equal to the rate of radiative recombination. And if we call this R spontaneous as a function of nu, where nu is the vibrational frequency, R spontaneous nu d nu must be equal to P absorption nu that is the probability of absorption uh, to rho nu, which is the density of uh, photons at that frequency nu into d nu, where p absorption nu is the probability of absorption of photon with energy H nu with frequency nu and rho nu is the radiation density at a frequency nu uh, within an interval d nu. Now, we know from uh, Planck's law 
that rho nu d nu is equal to 8 pi squared sorry 8 pi nu squared n r cubed over c cubed and the Bose Einstein factor E over H nu K B is the Boltzmann constant minus 1, where nu is the frequency, N R is the refractive index of the material of the semiconductor, which is considered to be constant, independent of nu. C is the velocity of light and uh, K B is Boltzmann constant. This is to distinguish it from K, which is the extinction coefficient. Suppose we write this as equation 2, this is equation 1. Uh, now, the absorption probability of a photon is related to the mean lifetime in the system. So, P nu is just 1 by tau nu. So, this is say equation 3 and this lifetime can be related to tau nu is nothing but 1 by alpha nu, where alpha is the absorption coefficient. Further, we have uh, photons traveling with the velocity of light in the medium V is C by N R. So, tau nu is nothing but one by alpha nu into V. Sorry, uh, here uh, this is not equal to, but this is, is proportional to, this is proportional to 1 by alpha nu. Okay. So, tau nu is equal to 1 by alpha nu into the velocity v uh, and therefore, p nu is equal to alpha nu into v and this is alpha nu v is c by n r. Now, if we, we now know uh, p nu, we know rho nu from uh, radiation uh, formula and so if we substitute we know p, we know rho, so if we substitute here we get for r sp spontaneous that is equal to alpha nu 8 pi nu squared n r squared over c squared exponential h nu by k b t minus 1 into d nu. So, this is a fundamental relation between the radiative uh, recombination rate R S P and alpha nu which are both properties of the 
semiconductor. And the other terms here are uh, constants like C. Uh, NR depends upon the uh, material, the semiconductor refractive index, and the KB is a constant. Obviously, this depends upon T. It, it is a strong function of, of the temperature. Uh, so, in principle, this is the uh, relation which relates R S P nu to alpha nu. Now, um, alpha can be expressed in terms of the extinction coefficient uh, because we know, um, as we had seen earlier, that alpha nu is nothing but 4 pi nu k nu by C, where k is the extinction coefficient. It's the imaginary part of the complex refractive index. So one can rewrite the expression uh, using this equation and uh, then one gets R nu is 32 pi squared k nu n squared nu cubed over c cubed exponential h nu by k b t minus 1 d nu. So now uh, the relation is between R and the extinction coefficient k, which can be measured experimentally. Um, this is d nu, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, R nu d nu. Uh, the total uh, rate of uh, recombination um, is obtained by integrating over nu. So, total recombination rate per volume per second uh, is obtained by integrating over all photon frequencies and uh, we can use to simplify it we can use the a different variable we can change the variable from nu to u defined as u is equal to h nu by KBT, or therefore DU is H by KBT D nu. And if we uh, use this, then we find that U is equal to H by KBT, and instead of nu, we can write alpha nu C over 4 pi nu k nu. This is from the expression 7. This is using this expression. And writing nu is equal to alpha c over 4 pi k. Alpha c by 4 pi k. Therefore, R is equal to uh, 8 pi nr squared kbt cubed over c squared h cubed, and then we integrate 0 to infinity alpha as a function of nu u squared over e to power u minus 1 du. 
So this is a final expression expressing the total radiative recombination in terms of alpha, which is a, a, the absorption coefficient. In this expression, uh, the semiconductor is characterized by uh, NR, the refractive index, which is considered constant, and, of course, alpha nu. Uh, we can further simplify this for um, actual graphical representation by writing uh, just we can uh, say that there is a factor which is independent of material which is just u is equal to 8 pi c squared kb t over h cubed u squared over e to the power u minus 1. And therefore, if we use this, then the expression r nu d nu is just nr squared alpha nu into into U. So, if we know alpha, we can, we know NR, we can calculate this constant, then we can uh, find out R. Uh, I'll illustrate this uh, graphically for a material uh, germanium at 300K, uh, whose extinction coefficient is known and one can now germanium is an indirect band gap semiconductor and we know that band gap is 0.67 EV at uh, room temperature the lowest band gap so if we plot the extinction coefficient versus H nu into EV, then we find that the extinction coefficient starts off at about 0.67. It goes like that. And this is the extinction coefficient K, which is related to alpha. Now, from this, we want to find out what would be the radiative uh, recombination spectrum. This is the extinction spectrum as a function of, of nu. Um, using this now, and uh, knowing NR, we can calculate this. And here we use... Uh, we change from u to a factor u dashed, which is just a constant. It's a material independent sort of term. 32 pi squared c cubed kb t by h to the power fourth into u cubed over e to the power u minus 1. It's related to u. So this term has a variation uh, because of nu. It has a variation uh, something like this. This is this term u dashed. So we, we know alpha from k. We know u is substituted by u dashed, and from this we can calculate what is the radiative recombination uh, spectrum, which comes out to, say this is r, which is nothing but uh, p nu d, uh, rho nu in centimeter per centimeter cube per second, and the spect spectrum that we get is of this type. Um,
So we find that there are two peaks and notice that this lower peak corresponds to this absorption edge at 0.67 eb and there is a higher peak uh, corresponding to an energy of about 0.8 eV. Now, can you explain this physically on the basis of the band structure of germanium? This is where absorption is very starts. This is the absorption edge. This is the indirect absorption edge. So, obviously, electrons and holes which are created uh, due to absorption will recombine and giving rise to radiation here. What is this due to? Right. This is due to the fact that if you look at the uh, band structure of germanium, this is a sketch of the band structure of, of germanium at 300K. And notice it is an indirect cap material. The lowest conduction band is at L, 111 point. Okay. So this, this value is 0.67 eV. However, there is a direct gap here, uh, which is at 0.8 eV. So obviously, uh, if electrons are in this L minimum and the holes are here, this is an indirect transition. It requires participation of phonons. However, if the electrons are here, the electrons can recombine directly with the holes, as in the case of uh, Gallimard stand or a direct gap material. And one, therefore, if you look at this uh, radiative recombination spectra, here you have much stronger recombination due to the direct, higher direct energy gap of germanium. So this illustrates that if you know K, the extinction coefficient or the absorption coefficient from that, you can calculate without doing any experiment uh, the radiative recombination spectra uh, of any semiconductor. One can, for example, uh, if you look at the band structure of silicon, which we'd seen before, silicon also has an indirect gap at 1.12. And it has a higher direct gap at about 2 eV, 2.5 eV. So the um, radiative recombination uh, spectra of silicon will be similar to germanium. It will have uh, one peak at about 1.12 indirect gap and another peak at about uh, 2.5 corresponding to the direct gap. So. Uh, For germanium, we have the indirect gap at 0.67 eV, direct gap at 0.82 eV, whereas for silicon, we have an indirect gap at 1.14 eV and uh, a direct gap at about 2.5 eV. Obviously, for Gallimard's night, we shall get the lowest gap is direct at 1.41, and we'll get a strong emission peak at uh, 1.41 eV. Now, if you compare this, the spectra, the absorption, and the um, emission Overall, the absorption spectra uh, couples from a photon can come in and excite electrons from a band of states in the valence band to a band of states in the conduction band. Okay? So you, one has a rather broad spectra, the absorption spectra. But the emission spectra couples only the 
requirement for emission is that the states in the conduction band have to be occupied and the states, corresponding states in the valence band have to be unoccupied. So there's only a narrow band of states in the conduction band and the valence band that, that couple, and hence the emission spectra is much sharper and it exhibits peaks, whereas the absorption spectra, as you can see, uh, broadly speaking, uh, the region of maximum slope here gives a peak. Maximum slope in alpha gives a peak in R. Maximum slope here in K or alpha gives a peak in radiatory recombination, and these peaks are, are very sharp. Later on, we shall, ident we shall look at the different uh, radiative recombination mechanisms and identify um, uh, different types of uh, recombination processes. They could be direct band-to-band, -band, could be uh, exciton-mediated, or could be impurity mediated. Right. Uh, when we look at uh, radiative recombination spectra, we would like to explain the spectra. And uh, to explain uh, recombination spectra, luminescence spectra, we sometimes take the help of what are known as configuration coordinate diagrams. And I will just briefly explain. the significance of these diagrams. Uh, suppose we have a plot of energy versus distance or position this is a configurational coordinate axis of distance in which we say the system in the ground state has an energy. Uh, obviously, it occupies a position of lowest energy and it has a configurational coordinate axis at x0. This is the ground state of a system. Um, vibrational energy will mean that uh, uh, the system vibrates about this and uh, it may be in a slightly excited state, not at, uh, suppose this is given by um, some energy E, say. Okay. Now, if you excite this, um, these can be electronic energy states. If we excite this, then the excited state may have a minimum which is slightly displaced by delta x, and this may be the energy versus distance relation of the excited state. Such a diagram can help explain uh, some of the phenomena observed in absorption and emission. For example, if a photon of the right wavelength comes along, h cross nu, it will create, it will give rise to absorption. From say position from point A to point B, and since this is not in the, the minimum of this uh, diagram, uh, what happens is the system relaxes to the minimum, say, C, by emitting lattice vibrations, phonons. And thereafter, when emission takes place, it takes place at a slightly different energy. This is H nu emission and this is H nu uh, absorption to a point D, which is again not at the minimum of this and then rela further relaxation takes place from D to A 
by emission of lattice vibrations. So, such a configuration coordinate diagram explains the fact that, for example, H nu A, the energy is greater than H nu E, the absorbed energy is higher than the emitted energy, and this, as you know, is called uh, the Stokes shift. And the Stokes shift is just H nu A minus H nu H nu E. Here we are invoking the Frank Condon principle, uh, as you know, that the electronic transitions are too fast for the atoms to follow. Okay? The atomic coordinates do not change when the electronic transitions take place. Then after uh, the electronic transition has taken place in the excited state, the system adjusts, the atomic atoms may relax, this is called relaxation to its minimum energy configuration. The electron transition occurs again, emitting radiation and then atomic relaxation takes place. Um, so, this explains uh, the well-known phenomena of, of Stokes shift. And uh, as a problem, um, I can ask you to consider that uh, sometimes we have uh, an anti-stoke shift. That means the emitted energy is higher than the absorbed energy. So, as a problem, I'd ask you to think of this. What is the, consider, uh, what is the condition under which this anti-Stokes sh shift can... Um, yes, think, think about that and uh, uh, let me know um, what is the possible explanation for that. So, um, okay, let me just go back to this and explain, uh, write it out. A, A, B is a process of, of photon absorption BC is phonon phonon emission uh, CD this process is photon emission and again uh, DA is lattice relaxation or, or phonon emission. Now, we can make, we can put this in more quantitative terms and we can actually, if we know what H nu A is and H nu E is, we can, uh, f for example, find out what this delta X is. Okay. Uh, as an example, let me just consider the case where we have, for simplicity, let me uh, draw this ground state minimum at x equal to 0 and the excited state could be shifted somewhat Notice that there is obvious crossover this intersection. Uh, this is the lowest energy in the ground state and this is the excited state. So, in this diagram, 
absorption corresponds to this energy E ebbs and the emission corresponds to E emission and the difference between the two lowest two minima can be given as E0. Now, one can make uh, certain approximations for calculations and say that uh, let the these uh, variation of energy with configuration coordinate be parabolic in nature. Okay? So, we, one can say that say the ground state energy uh, Ug is going as half kg x squared, where x is this configuration coordinate. It may be the relative displacement of the center of electronic charge to the uh, to the atom. Uh, what is kg? Kg is a force constant. In the excited state, U e is half, the force constant could be different, half Ke and x minus x0 squared plus E0, E0 is this, because the minimum is not at the same place and uh, the energy is raised by E0. So, if we use such a relation, we can write that E absorption is E0 plus half Ke x0 squared minus half H nu G. This is the uh, zero point energy and E emission is equal to E0 minus half kg going down to the ground state um, x0 squared plus half h nu, where again we can, in the harmonic approximation, we can say that the force constant Ke is nothing but 4 pi squared. It is in the excited state there is vibration with frequency nu e of a mass, total mass Me. And in the ground state Kg, the force constant is nothing but 4 pi squared nu um, I think this will be 4 pi squared nu e squared and this is nu g squared and this is the mass of the system in the uh, ground state, and this is in the excited state. And from this, one can, um, what do you, experimentally, what do you measure? Experimentally, you can measure EM0. Okay. We can, we know M. We can, uh, in simple cases, we can say that ME is equal to MG. Uh, we know nu e and the nu g, the lattice vibrational frequencies. And from this, we can find x0. We can find this displacement x0. If we find, if you know another parameter, we and that is EQ. What is EQ? Experimentally, uh, suppose a system is in the excited state. When can it be deactivated? Yes, it's a uh, Yes, it's an activation energy, and the Q 
gives you a hint EQ is the thermal quenching energy, the energy for thermal quenching. That means if the experiment is done as a function of temperature, okay, the um, you will you will get if you measure the emission intensity as a function of temperature, you will find that the intensity will remain constant and then go down as a function of temperature and this gives the thermal activation energy, EQ for, for quenching. Uh, this is an example that I have given based on uh, uh, some of the experiments done in our lab. We find that, for example, when we have In indium phosphide, if we dope indium phosphide with copper, which is a divalent ion, obviously this forms acceptors, and uh, we find experimentally that E m emission takes place at 1.216 eV. Uh, copper forms an interstitial complex um, with zinc in an acceptor site of this type and uh, we can take for example M is M of phosphorus plus some alpha squared M indium. This mass of the system is the mass of the phosphorus atom plus the indium in the nearest neighbor sites. That, that is forming the system, uh, the radiative recombination system. So if uh, all this is known, then experimentally we find that for example, the quenching energy is 77.4 MeV. What is done is actually we, we then know, we know this curve because Kg is known. Uh, we know this curve because Ke is known. We, if we know the difference, okay, we, we, we know uh, and we know EQ, so we can adjust these two curves so that we get the right crossover. And from that, we deduce, in this case, that uh, X0 is 0 0.079 angstroms. Okay. So this displacement of the excited state is, a very, is very small. So there is a very, so what, what do we deduce? that this lattice relaxation is very small. Okay. The two minima are displaced by a uh, very small uh, value of x. x0 is very small. This is a case of uh, a small lattice relaxation. In the case of ionic systems, this lattice relaxation may be quite large. Um, also, since this lattice relaxation is, is small, the, this energy difference the energy given away to phonons is also uh, quite small. And using this, we can actually calculate uh, how many phonons are involved in this lattice relaxation process. Okay. We, can, we can calculate. I'll give that to you as a problem. You can actually calculate uh, the number of phonons. Remember, the phonons have very low energy, small energy. Uh, and so to dissipate uh, this difference in energy, uh, quite a large number of phonons uh, can be involved. It may be uh, 10 to even 50 phonons, uh, which may be involved in this lattice relaxation. So I'll uh, stop there. In this lecture, what we've done is we've uh, discussed the relation between radiative recombination and absorption. 
if we know the absorption spectrum of any system, we can calculate the expected radiative recombination spectrum. Um, and also, we have looked at uh, methods of analysis of uh, experimental data. If we know the absorption energy, the emission energy, so we can uh, compute a configuration coordinate diagram. And on the basis of that, we can estimate what is the lattice relaxation and also the number of phonons involved in this lattice relaxation.